All right, well, thanks everyone uh, for coming. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about today uh, is the use of navigation for corpectomy in the thoracolumbar spine. And if I can make just kind of one comment about it is that in general, I think a lot of the stuff you're gonna learn about today uh, and tomorrow for that matter has to do with technologies that allow you to do things you already do, but to do them better. And that's kind of the key of it, right? This is not necessarily something that you're gonna go take home to say, oh, this has completely revolutionized what I have done, something I couldn't do before, now I can do it. This is the process of adopting technology, of adopting new techniques, new things to make what you already do better. And that's what navigation for corpectomy really is, is that it's something that everybody in this room does with relative frequency to one degree or another. And this is something that allows you to do it better or maybe allows you to do it safer so that you can think about some of the other things in a, in a given case, right? So here are my disclosures. Um, so the goals of corpectomy, right? So tumor and trauma makes perfect sense, right? That's, that's easy, that's straightforward. Um, and there's other th things you can think about other than just taking out a tumor. It has to do with how can I do it faster? How can I do it more efficiently? How, what levels should I be doing in terms of my fixation? What kind of biologics should I be using? Any variety of things to necessarily to achieve a better outcome for that patient. And when, when actually taking out the tumor and reconstructing that anterior column is easier with something like navigation, it allows you to produce a, potentially a better outcome for the patient, or at least to think about those details a little bit more, right? Uh, osteomyelitis, right? So that's something where you can have vertebral body destruction. Somebody needs a corpectomy. The cage I'm gonna talk about today is, is what's called T2 stratosphere, indicated for use in the cervical spine for osteomyelitis. Otherwise, there are, are ways you can use these devices to also realign the spine. Not true VCR for deformity correction necessarily, but ultimately to allow you to, again, think about those principles when you're doing a corpectomy for one reason or another. Any technology, in my mind, has to provide essentially two things. One is obviously safety, and the other is efficiency. Any technique, any new way of doing things or, or, or lesson learned has to provide these two things. So if you can do things either safer or quicker, then you can, again, it allows you to think about some other things. You've got a fracture at the apex of your natural thoracic kyphosis. What levels do I need to fixate above and below that fracture? What does that mean for their long-term risk of either proximal or, or, or distal failure? How do I make it more efficient in the OR? Uh, do I have to do two levels above and two levels below? Maybe it's three up and three down, that kind of thing. But if taking the, the, the tumor out or fixing the fracture uh, is less of a stressful thing, then allowing you to figure out those small details is important, right? So take a case like this. So this is a 69-year-old woman with OPLL and myelopathy, right? This is not a discussion on front, back, or myelopathy, fusion, laminoplasty. That's not the discussion. But say in this case you decide she needs a corpectomy, right? So you decide or you want to approach this from the front. So you go ahead and, and plan to do an operation where you need to get the spine decompressed and do your corpectomy, right? You end up with a construct like this. But is this a case where you need navigation? The answer is no, right? Um, this is a case you've done, you know, a hundred times, thousand times, where you, we've kind of figured out how to do anterior cervical pretty well with just using fluoro. So why complicate things with, with a new technology that maybe you are not real comfortable with or that you're just starting to use? So the point is, is that technology in this situation doesn't add... Uh, added safety really, because you're looking at the spinal cord. It doesn't add efficiency because it just, you already have the tools you need and you have a workflow that works. So point is, is don't try and use a technology to make something better when you've already done doing it at a high level. So where you may want to utilize technology and navigation is when you have something maybe in the thoracolumbar spine. So if you approach these issues from, a, from, from the posterior and say it's a tumor, right? Or you have to consider what needs to be done. Do you do midline laminectomy and stabilization? Do you do a transpedicular decompression, costo transversectomy, lateral extracavitary? All your different options, and you can kind of see on the graphic there what the different visibilities you get with each approach. And obviously each approach is more invasive, but as you 
start to get more and more visibility of the vertebral body, of the pathology you're trying to treat, there are certain aspects of it that you can't see, right? So in the anterior cervical spine, you're staring at the cord. It's very straightforward, but in the thoracolumbar spine, you're worried about structures in front of the spine, and you have less and less visibility. So in general terms, the less you can see, the more you need image guidance to help you, right? So take a case like this, 33-year-old, falls off a roof, um, T8 fracture dislocation, spinal cord injury, Asia A, um, but needs to have this fixed, right? So you can see, obviously, um, significant fracture, a lot of uh, fragments in the canal. Ultimately, this needs to be stabilized and reduced. When you do this from a direct approach, you know, or from a, lateral, a posterior approach, your direct visualization for something like this is basically about that amount, right? But what about all the bone over here? Right? You gotta, how are you going to get that? Well, you can go to the other side right, and, and do it there, or you have your assistant or your partner or fellow, whatever it is, do that side, but there's still this little bit in the middle. Right? And this is just an axial slice, so this is just looking at it one slice. The reality is, is that there are, there's that area that is usually caudal to where you're working, down by the disc below, midline, reaching across. There's all kinds of things that are difficult uh, to see exactly uh, what you're decompressing or what you're taking out, right? So ultimately then you start to use technologies to help you get there, right? So, and we'll talk about it in the next case about how taking the bone out and what you can use to get to do that. But then when you want to reconstruct it, you can see a device like this, right? So this is T2 stratosphere being navigated in the thoracolumbar spine, right? So what it is is basically confirmation in three dimensions of where you're placing this cage. Right? You can also use it to understand where there may be bone remaining, maybe where there's tumor remaining. Whatever it is, you can use the navigation to guide you to ultimately reconstruct that anterior column as best as possible. You can place it exactly where you want. You can move it all the way to the front. You can put it mid-body, depending on the size of the cage or the end, you know, end caps you use, et cetera. All these different things allow you to place it exactly where you want. Right? And the workflow part of this, where it's significant, is in the, depending on kind of how you place your screws and then do your um, tumor resection or, or, or fracture reduction is if, you've, if you're using navigation or ready to place your screws, then why not use it to place your inner body as well as opposed to having to take the, the navigation off and bring C-arm in or whatever you use to know that you're placing that properly. It's utilizing technologies that you already have to try and place this better, to place it in a more optimal position, maybe to make it bigger, uh, to, to safely place it uh, in a place that you know is going to uh, provide the support that it needs. So this is, you know, post-op or, you know, intra-op films for this. Um, and then you can kind of take it to another case, right? So this is an example of showing utilizing a bunch of different technologies together. So this is a woman with, a med with metastatic colon cancer who somewhat uniquely, uh, I, we were actually called by oncology to deal with this because she failed um, uh, cryoablation and vertebroplasty for pain and resistant tumor just in that L4 body. Right? So they asked me to kind of take out the L4 body essentially as source control for her tumor because she was responding systemically uh, to her treatment. So something like this, you want to do an L4 corpectomy, but you want to stay relatively short on it because you don't want to do two up and two down. And then you're talking about going to the pelvis potentially in this gal as well. So you want to stay as small as you can, but you have to have a good sound biomechanical construct, right? So in a situation like this, you can use something like stealth Midas to take out the tumor. If it, in this case, it's easy to see because they've had a vertebroplasty, but if you had to identify a lesion using stealth Midas, you can do that and essentially put it right on the tumor. Uh, you then can identify some of the important anatomic structures, right? So if you're doing a corpectomy, the things you worry about most are either the structures in front, right, violating the ALL, or violating the end plate of the level below or above. And so you can use your navigation to guide you so you know exactly where your ALL is, you know exactly where the end plate is, uh, et cetera, to identify that and then identify where you're, you're reaching across to try and get bone out. And then when you're placing your cage like this, again, you can place it optimally. Uh, and this, is from a, this, this example is from a posterior approach. You can place that cage exactly where you want it, right in the midline, and then expand it as you need to to fill the space to create that uh, biomechanical strength. 
So in this case, we also used a fenestrated screw, again, combining technologies to produce the optimal outcome uh, because this lady had poor bone quality. So we cement augmented the bottom screws to prevent um, subsidence and increase the strength there. So why, uh, does, why do we need to have a unique cage that can, that can fill these needs is largely because we, all the cages that are out there oftentimes are, are designed for a flat end plate, a perfect almost thinking about it as a cube or rectangle in three dimensions. But the reality is, is that that's not the actual anatomy. Right? And so you have to have something that allows for a little bit of flexibility and give to fit that end plate better. Right? The other thing is that you, you, know, you have these specified sizes, shapes, et cetera, of a variety of cages on the market. You want something that's a little bit modular. Right? So if you have these, these red dashed lines represent kind of what are the standard sizes, et cetera, but you want something that just gives you a little bit more freedom. Right? So T2 Stratosphere was designed to allow just that. Right, so these end caps are flexible. They move in, you can see there, 16 degrees that allows you then to fit that end plate perfectly. Right, and you can see on the, on the previous x-ray where it just kind of melded into the end plate above because that end cap is allowed to just kind of flex or to fit, excuse me, fit the space as best as possible, right? Ultimately then, as you expand the cage, you can then allow it to just contour right into that end plate and get great uh, interface with the bone, which increases then the stability uh, of the construct then and ultimately hopefully your fusion rate, right? So having that freedom that allows you to use the natural anatomy uh, is important, right? So this video, hopefully this will play, uh, this is showing the, the modularity or the change you can have in the OR uh, whether that is to create better alignment uh, or to better fit that cage because that cage allows it to move in the OR, right? So you can do that uh, in the OR. You can see here with compression, generating lordosis or just fitting that or it can be fracture reduction, whatever it is. And then studies are, are obviously kind of demonstrating the effectiveness of that um, uh, with uh, T2 stratosphere. So uh, the other thing about the cage I think worth mentioning is that uh, a cage like this is great because it gives you options, right? And that's kind of the key, right? We all have a different way of doing things. We all think our way is the best. We all think our, our recipe for, for how we get things to fuse is, is better than the next guy. The reality is, is that what we want are options, right? So it depends on the situation, depends why you're doing the case, what the indications are for ultimately what your options are for graph that you can put in it. Right. So to kind of give you a sense of it, something like a cage like this that allows you then to use a variety of graft options um, is something that can appeal to everybody. Right. And I think in something like this, it's kind of worth stressing again that when when we all leave here and we take the things that we learn back to our home institutions, it's not going to be that it's not going to be something that you've never done before that all of a sudden you're going to start doing at a high level. Right. The key of it. Right. So in order to create that that moonshot, so to speak, you kind of have to take that first step. Right. So something like this that gives you options, that gives you variability, that it gives you essentially customize, you know, your ability to customize what you do to your technique, to your style, but makes it faster, you know, potentially makes it safer, et cetera. All those things allow you to kind of then take the next step. Right. So I think what, you know, what a lot of us, you know, would ask as you, as you take these things back home is that you just take that first step. Right. Take something that you do, do it at a high level and try and do it a little bit differently and just kind of get out of the comfort zone a little bit. And, and, and you know, a navigated corpectomy like this is an, is an example of that that allows you to kind of take that that first step that ultimately then allows you to take the next steps after that and ultimately incorporate all these different things to kind of take it to the next level. Right. Finally, just kind of one uh, other case here of basically a, a corpectomy without navigation or without the flexibility of a cage that it contours to that, you know, another fracture. Ultimately, here you can see in the OR the, the inability to get that cage to contour appropriately uh, to the, the, the space that's there, CT on post-op day one. Well, it's not sitting great by any means, obviously, but I could, you couldn't appreciate that in surgery because you couldn't see how it was interacting with the end plate and didn't give you that. It subsided. Ultimately, then, 
you know, down the road, this is now two months post-op uh, where the cage is, is safe, but that's clearly not optimal, something that you're going to have issues with potentially down the road, right? But that with navigation, with a cage that has that variability, it allows you to avoid some of these things, right? So your ability to visualize the entire vertebral body is, is something navigation provides here. You can optimize the cage placement, which allows you to optimize the, the biomechanical stability or potentially the size of the cage, but ultimately then reduce the, the, the radiation exposure to, to yourself to your staff, et cetera, in the OR because you don't have to bring C-arm in and out. Uh, ultimately, you can do it all through the one navigation, uh, you know, one all through the O-arm spin that you already have. And ultimately, when doing that, it just increases your efficiency, not the first time you do it, not the second time you do it, but that fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth time you do it, those are the times where you're really going to see that improvement.